Ephesians chapter 1 verses 15 to 23. Let's read the text responsively. I shall begin. Ephesians 1 15. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. And what is the exceeding greatness of His power to us word who believe, according to the working of His mighty power? Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world but also in that which is to come. Together, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. May God bless the reading of his word and help us <coughs> to understand the truth of it. The theme for our meditation is in the question, are you thankful to the Lord. Very specifically in the text, two thanksgiving items, the faith and the love. So this is where I would spend much of the time in our meditation. And then we will move on to learn from Paul how we ought to express our thanksgiving to the Lord and how can we express our thanksgiving to Him? This passage is a prayer, very obvious, a prayer of thanksgiving and petition. So let us begin first of all by looking at verses 15 and 16. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Paul thanked the Lord for the faith of the Ephesians. As we come to the end of our 25 years of existence as a church, I would like to trigger thankfulness out of your hearts unto the Lord. Like I said, namely, salvation, that is saving faith. And then, it doesn't stop there. When the Lord saved us, He also continued to give us faith to walk in the path of righteousness. So I call this strength, the faith to follow Christ. And this is where I would like to begin. As I said, <clears throat> Paul was thankful to the Lord for the salvation of the Ephesians and he made it known to them in writing. And the Lord preserved it for our edification. So first of all, talking about the salvation, let us take some time to understand how the Lord saved some of the Ephesians. This we can know from the scriptures. If you turn with me to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 19, Paul first passed through Ephesus, but he did not spend much time there. And then in Acts 19, we know that he stayed there for a while. And I would like to bring you straight to verse 18. Let me read for you. <clears throat> and many of them, and many that believe, came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also which used curious arts brought their books together and burned them before all men. 
and they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. The thankfulness of Paul to the Lord for the faith of the Ephesians is clearly defined. Faith in the Lord Jesus. So this saving faith that came to them, if you read from Acts, it tells you of the great transformation in the life of the believers. What does the words uh, they brought their books together and the curious arts that they used to practice. It tells us that once upon a time, those people, they were caught in sorcery. They were in bondage by falsehood. And God mightily saved them. And that was how some of them got saved. Now if you were to look further down Acts 19, you will see the impact of their salvation upon the city of Ephesus. So much so that I call it, it nearly crippled the economy there. Because the silversmith there complained to the government. This man has turned many, has persuaded many. Right, if you look at verse 24, right, the man named Demetrius, right? He called together in verse 25 all the silversmith and said to them, This our occupation, our wealth. Now this man Paul had persuaded and turned away much people, saying there be no gods which are made of hand or made with hand. So that not only this our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised and her magnificence should be destroyed from all Asia and the world worship. Their salvation had an impact even in that city. Now Paul, as a pastor, he was thankful to the Lord for the faith of the Ephesians. My question to you, my dear brethren, is this. Can our pastor thank the Lord for your faith in the Lord Jesus? This question remains to be answered by only you and of course me. Only we ourselves can answer that question. Concerning salvation, let me briefly mention this. This is what I know that happened among us, which you may not know. The Lord has also mightily used us as a church, of course, through the preaching and teaching of our pastor, to save many souls. I know of at least one who was an ex-owner of a temple filled with idols. But when the grace of God came to his life, all those statues in his home were cast out of the house. And today, he is a believer. I also know of someone who once upon a time was caught by falsehood, even being used by evil spirit as a medium. And today, by the grace of God, he believe on the Lord and has been mightily delivered from all these bondages. So let us examine our salvation today as we enter soon into a thanksgiving month where we want to thank God for many things. The first thing we ought to thank God for is our salvation. Without this point of justification in our life, there is nothing we can thank God for. Right? So, is your salvation a cause of thanksgiving for your pastor? Examine yourself. Because many of us here who are saved, we must 
Thank God for this salvation. Or our salvation must be a cause of thanksgiving for our pastor. Now having said that, let me bring it one step further. Looking at Paul the Apostle as an individual, as an individual now. Are you thankful to the Lord for the salvation of fellow saints? Are you? Have you ever said, I thank God for the salvation of so and so? How the Lord turned him from worshipping idols to himself, the living and true God. You see, this is the great work of God. And as we read in our responsive reading, we want to show forth his salvation day from day to day. We must. And then we must declare this glory for the Lord. Now if you are thankful for the salvation of other saints, we are taught today to be like Paul. Let it be known unto the Lord. Let us thank God for the salvation of the saints that we know of. Start counting each and every one that you know of. If you do not know about their salvation, go and ask them, how did the Lord save you? Because every one of us has an impact on salvation. When the grace of God reaches us, it transforms us from a wretched sinner to one that God can use. Of course, in our text, in our text, we know that Paul wrote it down because this is a letter that he has written to the believers there to exhort them to walk in the paths of righteousness. And God, who inspired him to write, also preserved this writing of Paul, especially the letter to the Ephesians, for our edification. Now having said that, the question would be, how? How then can I make known my thankfulness to the Lord for the salvation of my brethren? Well, write it down, like Paul, write it down. Write it down and send it out so that the person that you are thankful for may know. So that others may know and be encouraged in the faith so that they may love the Lord even more and his people even now Paul's uh, thanksgiving to the Lord for the faith of people is not only to a church it is also written to an individual <clears throat> if you turn with me to Solomon the letter that he wrote to Solomon it is written in a <clears throat> Individual capacity, <coughs> a personal letter, right? And now I'd like to read to you from verse 4 onwards. I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers, hearing of thy love and faith which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in thy love because the powers of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. It is a very individual letter thanking God for his love unto the sin, huh? Solomon's love unto the sin, and his faith in the Lord Jesus. Solomon was a man at that time used by God to refresh the bowels of many. So likewise, you and I today, how can we encourage one another to walk in the faith that the Lord has given to us? One way is to write 
words of encouragement, especially to those who just turned to Christ, whom the Lord had just saved. Why? Why do I say this? Because they are young in the faith. They are very fragile, if I can use the word. They need lots of encouragement. I remember when I was a young believer, the Lord brought someone in my life. Though that person was, I believe, a bit fearful to confront me about my sins, he was also very gracious. And what he did was very simple. During that time, uh, maybe even now, this bookshop still exists, a uh, trumpet praise. He bought those uh, small little cuts. And then the one that he wrote to me has this uh, alphabets, W, W, J, D. What would Jesus do? That's what it meant. And then he wrote there concerning my habit of smoking cigarettes. So it really triggered something in me, you know. I am a believer, but am I walking in the way of the Lord? But I do not know how can I change, how can I give up this habit of smoking cigarettes? But this really caused an impact and always put a reminder on me. And I am thankful to the Lord even as pastor called me to preach this day. Because it was a very special day for me. That's why I remember. Some of us, we can remember when the Lord saved us, right? The day when we are born again. But as for me, I can't. I really cannot. But this day that I mentioned, this special day that the Lord gave me, is very memorable for me because this is the day of my turning point. 14 February 2000. The world call it Valentine's Day. But it is my special day. Why? Because it is the last, the day that I had my last puff of cigarette. Yeah, it is the day that I had my last puff of cigarette. And not only that, it started to progress from cigarettes to many other addictions, vices. It was the day that the Lord turned me back to Himself. So as we come together now to understand the thankfulness of Paul to the Lord for the believers, for the believers in Ephesians, for their faith in the Lord Jesus, let us examine ourselves how the Lord turned us back or how the Lord saved us and some of us were backslided, how the Lord turned us back to Himself. Now again, I say 14 February is a special day for me because that was the day that pastor called me to preach. And that day, I traveled to Kamaman to preach. And somehow, on this day, I have always been reminded, and this year especially, one of my friends reminded me, through writings again, but this is on the website, through the Facebook page. He put it in inverted comma, his Valentine's Day remembrance. What is that? Romans 5.8. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that prompted me to think, yeah, have I been thanking God for this great gift that he has given to me? The gift of salvation. So, brethren, let us encourage one another as we progress, as we walk towards our heavenly home. Encourage one another by writing. Writing words of encouragement based on scripture. Be thankful to the Lord for your salvation. And if you read what Paul has written uh, in our text, after I heard of your faith, right? Ephesians 1.15, after I heard of your faith. This faith is not only saving faith, but the faith that continues on. Right? Not only at the point of justification, but sanctification, ongoing. Right? Paul at that time, he was in prison. Many of those who were saved, they continue in the faith. 
That's why Paul can hear of their faith. That's why he wrote, After I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus, now your faith and my faith, our faith in the Lord Jesus must change the way we live towards holiness. We must make a stand for the Lord, our God. So dearly beloved, is your faith audible? As in, can your faith be heard? So much so that it could be uh, heard and uh, cause the hearers uh, to thank the Lord. Do you have such kind of faith that when people hear of so and so in this church, wow, I thank God for this person's salvation. Do you have that kind of faith? No, our faith must be like that, in that way. Because it must bring glory to the Lord our God. And then, if you read on, Paul not only thanked God for their faith but in the Lord Jesus, but also for their love towards all saints. Paul was thankful to the Lord for the love that believers in Ephesus has shown or has for other sins or even one another. Now this love is an expression of faith in the Lord Jesus. If you love the Lord, you will love his people. For how can you love the Lord if you don't love his people? This are people that we can see with our eyes, with our eyes. If we cannot love them, how can we love God whom we cannot see with our eyes? And then, as a Christian, this love that we are talking about here, this love for other saints is an expression of our obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Did not Jesus command us? Turn with me to John, please. Gospel of John. John chapter 13. John chapter 13 verses 34 and 35. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if you have loved one for another. Now the question would be, how did the Ephesians believer or the believers in Ephesus love? How was their love shown? So much so that it could be heard of by Paul who was in prison. This is something that uh, got me really, uh, really thinking. Now remember Paul spent some time with the believers there, minimum two years he taught them those who would want to know more about the Lord Jesus Christ and his way. Paul taught them for two years in Ephesus. Well, for me, I grasp a little bit. Again, coming back to Acts, the found, where we have the foundation of the Ephesians church, huh? Acts 18, 19, and 20. So right there in uh, Acts 20, 35, let me read to you this first. Paul called the elders and he said to them, I have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak and, re and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. So here, from the phrase, support the weak, how did the believers in Ephesus show their love one for another? I think there is a clue here. Because Paul taught them, support the weak. Now the word, <coughs> the word support has this idea of to hold on to. To hold on to those who are weak. And the weak, the weak there has this understanding of people without strength, who are powerless. 
So how can we apply this truth today? <clears throat> like I say, if you cannot love God's people that you can see, how can you say you love God whom you cannot see literally? Those who love God love His people. So here, <clears throat> let me try to uh, explain with God's help this phrase. I actually <coughs> <coughs> classified the weak in three areas. Okay, support the weak. So they love the people of God by their support. So who did they support? I put here into three category. Those who are spiritually weak, those who are physically weak, and those who are financially weak. Why? Why do I say the financially rich? In Paul's letter to Timothy, Paul told him, honor the widows that are widows indeed. Now in the era of Paul, there were many widows. In the early church, there were many widows. Widows are those who have no husband to support them. And so the church was taught to look at their needs. So here, let us think, how can we support the weak, those who are spiritually weak? I told you already, write to them with words of encouragement. Share with them what you learn in the message, especially the new believers among us. We have a ministry called the Encouragers Ministry that from time to time used to send letters. Maybe we can revive that to send at least one card to someone who is new in our church to encourage them to join certain ministry. We do have sisters who pick up the phone and call to invite new friends even those who have not believed, to come and join us in certain fellowship so that they may hear the word of God and be safe. And for this, I am reminded that I ought to do it for even the children ministry. Someone that I met last year gave me this idea. Though it's a sneer meal, but when you receive it, your heart will be blessed. Right? Sometimes it's good to be slow a bit. You know, so that you really think about what you want to say and how you want to encourage those who are weak in the faith. Now the church, as you know, has many activities. Do you come for such activities that are planned for your edification to encourage you in the faith that the Lord has given to you? We have one month of thanksgiving events starting with a gospel rally followed by three public lectures followed by a thanksgiving service and dinner if you are thankful to the lord you would want to come and be blessed if you are thankful to the lord you would want to tell others of this good news that you have heard in jesus christ that in him your sins are forgiven you will want to tell others, so bring, pray to the Lord to give you a soul, someone to invite to come. Then it is up to the Lord to work in the heart. But your, your uh, requirement is to do the invitation. Now as for the physically weak, do we have such people among us? Yes, we do have. They have difficulty coming to church. If you know of such, how would you help? How will you express your love for the Lord towards such people? One way is visitation. In our church, we have uh, someone who will officially visit. Right, but let's put it to ourselves. Right? We know we must visit. Don't visit only when something happens. As the Lord move your heart, go. Now if you call up and the person say, Oh sorry, we are not ready, our home is in a mess, please don't come, then there's nothing you can do. Right? Sometimes not necessary to go to the house. Sometimes you can ask them out. And then just strengthen one another. 
with the encouragement of God's word. Now again concerning the physically weak. When I was active in the Lions Home Ministry, especially the one in Topayo, there was one lady who kept telling me that she longs to come to church to worship God. But there is none to bail her out in a sense because it really takes commitment if you want to express your love to someone like that. You have to go to the lion's home to seek permission and uh, make sure you are, how to say, you will take care of the safety of that resident. Bring her out or bring him out and then bring her back or bring him back safely. It is a very big commitment. But if you are just married without children, you drive a car, there are three seats behind. Not only can you fetch such people, you can also look around at who lives near you and need help to come to church, right? You can send them. That is also a way to support the weak and also to express your love for one another, for Jesus' sake. And then the last that I mentioned, the widows. Though in our era, we do not have many, but we do have. And then today, widows may not be financially weak, but there are those who are financially weak among us. In every church, there will be the rich and the poor. This is the unique of our faith. It is a body of believers. The rich cannot say to the poor, I don't need you. The, the poor cannot say to the rich, I don't need you. We need one another. Just like Paul often used the illustration of the human body, right? The head, the hands, the legs. So likewise, let us learn how to support the weak so that we may express our love for the Lord Jesus and his people. Now would you help the saints to come to God's house for worship? If you have the ability, would you do that? May the Lord move your heart. May our love for one another be seen and heard by others that they could thank God for it. Thankfulness to the Lord ought to be made known. First of all, in prayer to the Lord. And then, like Paul, he wrote it down so that others may know. Right, Paul's thankfulness to the Lord is made known to all who read his epistle. He was thankful for the faith of believers in the Lord Jesus and their love one for another. I've quoted from even a personal letter to Philemon to you. So now, let us move on. Eh? We have learned uh, about the faith in the Lord Jesus and we want to challenge or examine ourselves the salvation that God gives to us how to express out this faith and love to the Lord now let us move quickly on uh, to the next portion of our meditation Ephesians 1 17 onwards let me read to you again to refresh our memory Ephesians 1, 17 to 23, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know. Take note of this verb, that ye may know. What is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the sins? And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this world but also in that which is to come, and have put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things 
to the church which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Here, Paul's thankfulness to the Lord for the faith and love of the believers in Ephesus led him to pray for their spiritual growth. The areas that Paul mentioned is listed and we'll consider them very briefly. In the knowledge of Christ, right? To know the hope of Christ's calling. To know the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. To know the exceeding greatness of Christ's power to those who believe. Okay, remember he is thanking God for the believers. So here, let's come to verse 17. Paul prayed that God would increase the knowledge of Christ. Every thankful pastor, elder, teacher of the word must learn from the Apostle Paul. To pray for those sitting before them that they would grow in the knowledge of Christ. Is it not a joy to see the mature, uh, maturity of faith in the believers? How they change in their appearances, in their characters, in the way they behave. You know, it is a life towards sanctification and this is a lifelong pro process. Right? If we love the Lord, we would be transformed by His Word. And how can we be transformed in His Word other than we are taught by it? And also, the pastor would pray. So now here, many of us are given opportunity to teach, to teach children. Do you pray for their spiritual growth? Of course, first of all, the salvation. Uh, if there is no salvation, no grow. Uh, how to grow? Right? So, when you know that this child is a Christian boy or Christian girl, do you pray for their growth in the knowledge of Christ? Now, like I said, it is a joy to see people growing. But it can be very disheartening to see people not growing in the Lord. After so many years, still the same. That puts a very big question mark concerning the person's faith in the Lord and the love for one another. Why? Because it seems to have no life in him. Right? So as Paul prayed to the Lord that the believers would grow in their knowledge of Christ, likewise let us examine ourselves. Are we growing in the Lord? This is something very important, spiritually speaking. Because you and I know that there must be growth. There must be growth. If you are not growing, then the question mark remains. Are you safe? Are you truly born again? Because the word of God would have seen no impact in your life. You sort of like don't have the hope, right? The hope in Christ. The hope of his calling. Where we will read next. Next Paul prayed in verse 18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. That ye may know what is the hope of his calling. Let me go through all the prayer items first, then I would touch on the verb that I ask you to take note, that ye may know. Paul prayed that the believers in Ephesus would know the hope of Christ's calling. Now the word hope denotes certainty. It denotes assurance. You and I who are Christian, who are saved, we are called out of sin and falsehood. Correct? We are called out of sin and falsehood. In Christ, the forgiveness of sin is certain. If you are in Christ, your sins are forgiven. It is certain, assured. Now let me also take this time to address the non-Christians among us. 
Turn to the Lord Jesus Christ today and your sins will be forgiven. This is the hope that every Christian has and it will be yours too if you turn to the Lord. Now there is no or there is none who can forgive sin except the Lord Jesus Christ. If you are among us, you would have heard the gospel of Jesus Christ many times. You will know the teachings of the Bible, that Jesus is the Lord. He is the way, the life, and the truth. No one goes to the Father except through Him. Believe on Jesus and you can be certain that all your sins would be forgiven. Remember I told you how I recall about my salvation? The verse that I quoted, Romans 5, 8. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for our sins. Our sins are paid by Christ, forgiven. Now Paul, Paul knows about the hope he has in Christ. He pressed the word, the mark for the price of God's calling. This hope of Christ's calling is like a magnet, a magnet that draws you towards it. It draws believers to walk in the life of faith. Somehow this hope in front of you would uh, drag you along. You now if you have this hope of Christ's calling to come out of sin, as you follow Christ towards that direction, all this besetting sin, it will be put, it will uh, fall off, if I can say. It's just like when you are running together with other people, you don't have to know them. Like for example, if you go to Bedok Reservoir and run, many people are running. Now you will be amazed if you look up in front of you someone who is running. You will automatically follow his pace. That's what I learned some time ago. When you are together in a group and everybody is going in that direction, somehow they will affect you to go and uh, fasten your pace. And this hope of Christ's calling is something that will draw you and me towards Christ. As we live out the life of faith, we will be transformed, sanctified, right? I use, this is the term given, sanctified make holy. It's not our choice, but it's a command that we must obey. Be ye holy as I am holy. The life of a Christian is a life of sanctification. God sanctify us and we are to move toward the hope of his calling. Like Paul, toward the mark. Huh? Paul said toward the mark for the price of uh, God's calling. Now, concerning the hope again, how come we have this hope in us that will draw us towards Christ? Because when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is in every believer to guide them into all the truth of God's word, to lead them in path of righteousness. Are you aware of the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life that guide you into the truth of God's word and leads you towards that hope so that your life will bring glory to God as we see in the next prayer item of Paul the connection and what and sorry and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints Paul prayed that the believers in Ephesus would know the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Believers are God's possession, correct? You and I, we are God's possession in Christ. Christ bought us with his blood. In the words of Peter, we are a peculiar people. 1 Peter 2.9, we are a peculiar people. 
And then, Paul in his writing to the Romans teaches us that we are vessels of God's mercy. Let's turn to Romans. Romans chapter 9. Verse 23, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory, even us, whom he had called out, whom he had called not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. So here we have this uh, assurance from God's word that God called us out. Huh? We are of the Gentiles. And then, the reason that he might make known the riches of his glory upon who? Upon us, the vessels of his glory, uh, mercy, so that in Christ we can become the trophies of God, that God can be glorified in our life. Why vessels of mercy? Because Paul also told the Ephesians that at that time you were without Christ, when you were not a believer, being aliens of the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope without God in the world. Once upon a time, you and I, we are in such a state because we have no relationship with God. We do not know Christ. Ephesians 2.12 Then Paul contrasts it in verse 13. But now, but now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Dearly beloved, we are vessels of God's mercy. Once upon a time we have no mercy, but today we receive the mercy of God. So let us be very thankful to the Lord, which is why the theme for our meditation is, are you thankful to the Lord? Now let me move on, uh, because in our text, we still have a few verses to cover. I want to do it very quickly, like I said, briefly. In, uh, we are now at verse 19. Uh. Let me read again verse 19 to refresh your memory. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Verses 19 and 20 of our text. Paul prayed for the believers in Ephesus that they would know the exceeding greatness of Christ's power. Paul used a total of four different Greek terms to describe the omnipotence of God. Here. Let me point out to you the word power that you see here. Eh? His power it is the word dynamite. It has that explosive power, that impact. And then you see towards the end, according to the working, right? The word working is also a word that you know. Energy. Energize. It is the word energize. How can a person in Christ live a righteous life in the power of God. So Paul used different terms to explain it. Energize God, the working of the Spirit. And then towards the end there are two, right? Of his mighty power, the working of his mighty power. Another two different Greek words that is translated power and uh, mighty. Now all these terms that Paul used, they refer to the various aspects of the working of God's omnipotent, how he empower the believer to live in the to live a life and walk in the path of righteousness. Now remember I told you to take note of the phrase that ye may know. In this prayer of Paul, right, Paul prayed that the believers might know. He did not use the verb might have. In other words, what I'm trying to tell you now is that you and I have that power from the Lord. All these things, the hope, 
of His calling, the glory that God has prepared before for us, and the power. Know that it is already given to you. You have them. Paul did not pray that they might have, that they might know. So know, know that these are already given to you. So that when you know you have the hope of Christ's calling, you may walk towards the price of his high calling. And in walking there, you may glorify God. As you glorify God, God also honor you. That is the glory that he has prepared before for you. And then where does all this strength to move in that sanctified life? It is the working power of the Spirit of God. The dynamic, working, energizing power of God that moves you to live a life of faith. Even as we are today, there are many things because of our Christian faith we do not do like the world. So may God help us to live a life that brings glory to Him. Now to run through the text, let me also say from verse 21 to 23. Let us also know that our Lord Jesus Christ is the King of kings, the Lord of lords, right? If you read, for far above all principality, God has set him far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world but also in that which is to come, and have put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over the things of the church which is the body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So having this knowledge or understand the truth that we have learned today, may the Lord help us to express our thankfulness to him for the faith that he has given to us, namely our salvation, for the faith of others and the faith that we have to live out a life in righteousness and also the faith to love others as we ought to as we follow his commandment and all this please remember this is a prayer of Paul we must learn how to pray to the Lord in thanksgiving and also for the growth of our fellow saints so let me quickly conclude what we have learned today. Are you thankful to the Lord? Paul was thankful to the Lord for the Ephesians, for the saving faith, in other words, for their salvation. And then the next thing about their faith is their faith in the Lord, because after that he heard how they lived their Christian life in that era. Not easy, eh? If you know during the Roman Empire, you can be killed for your faith. Today, one thing that I can tell you is that you may not be killed for your faith if you are in Singapore. Other country, no guarantee. Huh? There are still some that are very hostile. But what I want to put towards you today is this. To trigger the thankfulness in your heart to the Lord. For your own salvation, for the salvation of others. For your faith to walk in path of righteousness and that of others. And then this faith must be expressed out in love one towards another, in prayer to God and also in action. Because how would Paul know of all this when he was in prison? Right, so it tells us that the faith of the believers then and their love for one another was seen, it was heard. It was told. So may God help us to know this and to live out such a vibrant faith that others may know. Now, another thing that I want you to thank God for is this prayer of Paul is preserved for our edification, right? For our learning. So let us also thank the Lord for the preservation of his word. This point in the sermon is actually in X3. I was thinking whether to bring it up or not to bring it up. But I thank God for confirmation. The Lord always confirms. 
in the past, uh, intercessory prayer of Elder Ma, he mentioned the thanksgiving to God for the preservation of his word. We thank God that we have a Bible in our hand. So let's thank God for this text or this passage that we have read, that we have learned, so that we can bring his word to the unbelieving world around us, so that we can uh, use it to edify the saints, to encourage one another in our walk with the Lord. And then let me conclude with these two verses that we have read during our responsive scripture reading. Sing unto the Lord, bless his name, show forth his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the heathen, his wonders among all the people, for the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. May the Lord help us. Let us pray.